Welcome to a new episode of Demand Gen Chat. I'm your host, Tara Robertson, head of Demand Gen at Chili Piper. In this episode, I'm joined by Amir Atli, co founder and CRO at Hockey Stack. Hockey Stack has seen amazing growth in the last few months, and almost all of that is thanks to their LinkedIn presence. Amir shares how they've pulled off this growth and how they help their customers approach the often sticky problem of marketing attribution. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Amir. Amir, thanks so much for joining me on Demand Gen Chat. How's your day going? It's going really good. Um, we are onboarding a couple of people onto the team, so it's always busy, but I'm doing mm-hmm. really good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I'd love to just start right off the bat with something fun and spicy. Is there a marketing hot take you have or maybe something that you have seen on LinkedIn that you disagree with that you want to share with the audience? Yeah, there are lots of stuff. Um, <laughs> I think one of the first ones is nobody cares about you or your company. I think if you build enough like connection and if you build enough interest in the audience, everyone cares about you. Um, for example, for us, six, seven months ago, we were nobody, but now most of the demos start with, oh, how did you do this? Um, how did you do this like playbook? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it comes down to, I think, being a person that's interesting. So for myself, if I post about our product once and I try to post something really unrelated twice, um, and then for the company, we are launching something new almost every single week. And if we build something today, we are getting together like a couple of TZ videos and creatives. And then we hype this feature up for at least two weeks and then launch it. Even though our current mm-hmm. customers use it now, non-customers do not know about it. And then they know about it through those TZ videos. So... An example is we integrated ChatGPT and then we created two TZ videos and then we created Hype. And even we had a like wait list, somewhat like half fake wait list. So just mm-hmm. people comment on the post um, and like, can I get access, stuff like that. And then we booked around like 40 demos just from that post. Um, not just for the feature, but most of them were also interested in the product. And then we built, we built like a Hype and then lots of people followed the page all that stuff. So it's just about being interesting as a company and person. Yeah. And you're in a really interesting position because obviously you're a co-founder and you're running marketing. So a lot of marketers don't get as much, I guess, control. But a lot of us don't get as much control over Mm -hmm. these fun, flashy announcements. Every two weeks is amazing. I mean, I I think most marketers would love to have big announcements every two weeks. Um, Mm -hmm. But do you get other pushback from other co-founders on hey, this is too much, we have a lot going on on the technical side, or are you guys all on the same page about, we just have to keep this momentum going? Yeah, so generally, we are on the same page. Um, sometimes they say it's too much. Mm-hmm. And then what we do is, if there are some additions to the product that we did not announce, but still they were effective, sometimes we add a like, really small feature or like an addition to the product, we don't really care about it because we don't think it's going to be having a, like much effect on the customer experience. But then from the feedback that we get f- through the Slack channels we have with our customers, mm. they say it's amazing. It's like affect our um, workflow day to day. Then we create a like teaser video and then launch it on LinkedIn. Sometimes I, we do that. Sometimes we turn those additions into free products. So we worked on a UTM URL cleaner which is Mm -hmm. basically what we are doing through Slack channels. We are sending these are like CSV files to our customers. These are the errors in your UTMs. And then we just built a free tool and then we're going to launch it soon. So if I get a pushback from my co-founders, then I try to turn all the other things into teasers. That's really cool. So kind of creating those marketing announcements when at surface level, it maybe isn't announcement worthy, but then you hear that feedback from customers and that's really cool. Um, I'd love to shift gears just a little bit. And uh, you mentioned that you always have something coming up. You're a busy guy. But what are you really focusing your time on this ne- right now in this quarter? And do you think that'll change? As you mentioned, you've hired a couple of new key people. I've seen some of those announcements. They look like great hires. But how will that change the focus of your day to day? Yeah, and also um, connected to the first point. What we do is like we try to turn not just product launches, but we try to turn every single thing that we do into a content piece. So with mm-hmm. every single hire, I record a podcast episode, turn that into a YouTube video, turn it into a blog post, and then launch every, everything together once we hire someone. Um, like everything we do is going to be a content. 
and then that also builds a like connection with the audience and it's like make us more interesting um for my focus my core focus right now is the flow our new media company and our hires right now when we hired head of content obed um and now we are hiring a content creator so they are gonna be building the flow so what the flow is it's basically all the media that we produce gonna live on one landing page one youtube channel and a couple podcasts my focus right now is so far i have like a podcast i did i think 20 episodes there um like i had amazing guests but the core focus was on the guest rather than us and Mm -hmm. it it makes sense um to get some authority from the guest into your side from now on we are going to put our team into the like focus so uh, we are as we are building the flow our customer success managers will have a dedicated show in which they're going to talk about customer experience of our customers with clips um me and obed gonna have another show that's gonna put the focus on us um, I'm thinking of other shows as well. So just like putting, making Hockey Stack an expert and every single team member an expert in their own areas is my core focus. And we're also coming up with new categories of video series, rap songs, all the creative stuff. Um, and then our whole focus is educating the audience and also entertaining them. So it's going to be my focus. I don't think it's going to change. My other focus is rebrand so we are in a rebrand right now so we are changing the website the blog site all the pages that we have and i'm working on aligning sales marketing customer success all around a single message and that message is basically attribution so far was something that didn't work um visible takes months to set up other attribution tools you know the developer team data team with hockey stack setup is five to ten minutes you have everything in place from day one. Um, we are backed by Y Combinator. Um, and it's just the next big thing in this space. And if you don't jump onto this bandwagon right now, you're going to miss out as our like core message in our mm-hmm. sales demos, the first part. Um, and then I want our website to reflect this with a really good design and really good copy. Mm. It's a lot of different things to focus on. It's a big list <laughs> to do, but exciting yeah. stuff for sure. Um, since yeah. you brought up attribution, obviously I have to bring it up talking to you. Um, I'm mm-hmm. curious at a super high level. I know there's so many different takes on this, but how do you recommend your customers approach attribution? Like you said, some people overcomplicate it. They have data teams working in a silo from marketing. Other teams mm-hmm. just rely on self-reported. What's your recommendation for someone trying to figure this out? Yeah, I think the core focus should be getting as much data as you can. Um, for us, it is LinkedIn impressions, LinkedIn engagement, um, like ad impressions, ad clicks, everything that happens on the website, everything that happens on the CRM, getting all that data in one place. And my core focus is to understand the customer journey from the first marketing touch point all the way to contract signature and product engagement. I think if you don't have anything in place, just start with that. How can we bring all the touch points in one place and like see the entire journey, whether it's ABM, whether it is like smaller deals, you would need to understand how the deals are progressing so that your sales team can follow up with the deals that are not going well or your marketing team can, can ha- like have access to that data so that they can work on those deals in terms of retargeting, in terms of like webinars, all that stuff that they that you can do. Um, for our customers, I recommend this and they have access to this, but like having at least one person, like a marketing ops person or I don't know, a paid person so that they can check out this customer journey is often and then make um, edit, like changes to their strategy. Right now, our customer success managers also um, check out the dashboards of our customers every two weeks to give feedback. Things like, mm-hmm. this black box is working well, this ad is working well, I create a report to show this, stuff like that. Um, so we give support on that part too. For like specific advice, what I'm doing myself is, as you said, I'm, like, I'm, the, I'm a co-founder and I'm also running marketing and overseeing sales too um we have a head of revenue but i'm like the bridge between marketing and sales um what i'm doing is i have last touch tables and linear tables for Mm -hmm. the content and ads so if if i see like an ad campaign or a blog post is the 
most frequent last touch point, then we are creating retargeting strategies based on that blog post, based on that webinars, case studies, such as with direct response. And with linear, I can see all the touch points our customers have. That's one specific advice that no one does. Mm-hmm. Um, when I when I tell our customers that's like they're almost always surprised, but this is like really simple advice that would make a lot of sense to implement right now. Um, but other than that, I think the biggest debate is self-report attribution versus software-based attribution. And it doesn't, this debate is just nonsense because you can do both. Nobody mm-hmm. can stop you from doing both. Um, we are doing both. We have a like self-report attribution form in which we almost always get colleague, peer, search, browsing, stuff like that. But sometimes I love we get, when people just write internet. That's my favorite one. Yeah. <laughs> we get, yeah, we lot. get, we get lots of yeah. Googling too. Mm, mm, yeah. Um, yeah, we got sometimes interesting insights, but most of that is like those answers. On the last touch piece, I'm curious because a lot of people have different approaches there too. Are you looking at last touch before an op is created or are you looking further down to what actually got them to close the deal? Yeah, I look at last touch before, um, booking a demo mm. and yeah. sometimes we also do like we get sales touch points as well mm-hmm. what we are doing is we are comparing the deals that have been closed versus not closed and the email touch points um is there anything specific that made the other ones close and the other ones not close maybe timing maybe subject lines maybe the follow-up material etc i'm also taking a look at that this is after demo after the second mm-hmm. call Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. So on top of that, it sounds like you have an outbound team as well that's working. Are they working totally different accounts than marketing or are you guys all working from the same list of target accounts? Mm-hmm. So like so far, it's all 100% inbound. Mm-hmm. Um, now what we are doing is maybe this, this is also interesting. So we have a live demo. This is gated. Mm-hmm. So people need to enter the email addresses to access our live demo. And on the live demo, we have our entire product with dummy data. Um, And you can play with the product as long as you want. You can create filters. You can check out the product in details. And what we do is, from what I've seen on Hockeystack dashboard, like around 80% of the people who contact sales check out live demo before that. Mm -hmm. But we get, I think... I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we have lots of people check out live demo and not uh, contact sales for some reason. We have a fun template. It's like uh, my Spider-Man senses start working. This is a screenshot of your <laughs> session. Do you want to see the same thing for your visitors kind of thing? And with that template, we are using that for high intent companies that have either checked out our live demo, checked out our pricing or both. And we are mm-hmm. using Clearbit um, as well on top of it. And then we do this as in like outbound. We don't do any cold outbound so far yet. Yet, um, but I think we will do start doing that in a couple months too. And we will use the same list. So mm-hmm. same list that goes to LinkedIn will go to our sales team too, and they will have engagement metrics to focus on. Cool. Yeah. And what tool are you using for the live demo? We build it ourselves. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah, we're looking at a couple different ones right now. So that's <laughs> curious. No, I actually, like, we built the live demo before it was cool, like, two years ago, maybe. Um, it was one part of our website when we were, like, just starting out. <laughs> and we didn't think about it much. It was, like, the... I think it was natural to us. Then it became cool. Then it became expensive. Now we cannot, like, go with a tool anymore because we put so much effort into it. And what's cool yeah. about building it yourself is... You can customize some parts on the live demo. So we sometimes, if you want to highlight something, we are doing that on live demo because it's different than our own product. It's the same, but we can change some parts of it because it's our own code. Mm-hmm. With a tool, I think they are replicating the product exactly as it is. So you cannot change some parts. My, sometimes what we do is we like um, change text and then, I don't know, change it into fun jokes, stuff like that, that would make people laugh that probably you would not be able to do with it. And has it always been gated or did you experiment with leaving it ungated over? Yeah, it was gated until three months ago. Um, Mm -hmm. So why we did that is, of course, we are losing lots of people who don't want to enter the email addresses. But with this like follow-up 
email. We have we turn lots of entrances into um, demo booking. So until we probably early September or October, we will turn it into an ungated version. But until then, we are in a grow or die mode. So this makes yeah. more sense. I'm curious. I know you brought up LinkedIn a handful of times. It sounds like that's a huge channel for you guys. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about on the organic side specifically how you grew so quickly on LinkedIn? You kind of came out of nowhere and grew a pretty big following. Yeah, exactly. Like we are right now in the last seven months, our average growth in terms of revenue, actual revenue, not signups is 40, 45% month over month. And 90% of the pipeline at least comes from LinkedIn ads, LinkedIn social, or a combination of that. So what we see is, if people come from LinkedIn ads, if it's the last touch point, at some point they see us on social as well. Um, so our strategy is we have a list on LinkedIn ads. And when a company reaches a certain engagement level or impression level, which is usually 200, 250 impressions in a like high or very high engagement level, we get that list and then connect with related people like VP of marketing, head of marketing, head of dementia, et cetera, so that they see our posts as well. Me, my co-founder and CEO, Obed, Courtney, our CSM, um, and other team members post. I, I, we are posting twice a day. Some of them post like once a day. Um, we have a marketing calendar for the whole company so that we can see what each other is posting. Um, and what we're trying to do is, so if we, we have a like content calendar, and that's some parts of it come from me and Obed because we know what we want to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. So if we launch a feature, we let people know on Slack, this is a feature launch. Can everyone talk about it at least once this week? Um, and then we are also like um, collaborating with other people as well, with agencies and other SaaS businesses. And in general, what worked for us is just posting twice a day, being interesting, and then connecting parts that we talk about into the product. So sometimes mm-hmm. I'll talk about growth, but then connect it to the product. That's how we can report this stuff like that. That really works well. Um, other than that, what we initially did is just like meeting with people, sending hundreds of DMs to, to like meet, and then those connections those meetings turn into actual connections and now they're engaging with my content. That was not my purpose initially. It was just to meet with people. Now they're engaging. Now they know our brand and some of them turn into customers along the way. And it sounds like it was super intentional on your part to focus on LinkedIn. Did you ever try other channels organically or did you just say, let's just stick with this one and grow and make it work first? In terms of ads, we tried lots of things. Mm -hmm. Facebook didn't work. Um, YouTube didn't work. When I say didn't work, like we invested a couple thousands of dollars and then didn't get much out of it. Um, so mm-hmm. in terms of social, LinkedIn was the best channel because we are selling to B two B. In terms of ads, LinkedIn worked really well because we can connect that with social. So if people see an ad and then see that same person on the feed as well, that really gives people trust. With other channels, we are going to retar- We are using them for retargeting purposes mm-hmm. only. So yeah. you are still retargeting on Facebook, on YouTube, anywhere else? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, Facebook. What we are doing is actually um, for retargeting. I am using, like most companies, are just using G two and like testimonial stuff like that. We are using basically anything that might build trust in terms of things that we prioritizing with is like clips of my podcast podcast episodes that I've been a guest on um, like we had a couple influencers that we work with we get videos from them talking about hockey stack and basically anything like I have a playbook some parts of the playbook um, I also take screenshots of my posts advertise them because it's basically the same feed when people write an ad mm-hmm. copy they they're like overcomplicating it. When they write the same post on their personal page, they write it as they would write, I don't know, to a friend or texting. I'm, I know they're on the same feed, so I'm trying to keep things simple. And what I would post on my personal page, I would, I advertise them as well on the company page. 
And also something that I'm doing is um, if I have an ad creative in mind, I have first tested on my personal page, see if it's if it gets engagement. If it gets decent engagement, then I advertise that. And was there anything you tested that you thought would be great and it just really flopped? I guess does anything come to mind? Yeah, I created fake Twitter screenshots. Like mm-hmm. like a fake profile. I feel like I've seen some of these. <laughs> yeah, fake profile asking mm-hmm. what are you guys using for attribution and other fake profile answering hockey sack and then like a short description. It didn't work at all. CTS were like point point one percent. Um it might be the images were really like really small. It might be the reason, but I thought it would make sense. It didn't make sense. Sometimes it's just how it is. Yeah, it's just trial yeah. and error, right? Do you have a way of? I mean, it's a little bit easier when it's a small team, but do you have a way of documenting the different things you've tested and tried, and what kind of has won out so that you can share that with the rest of the team as you grow? Yeah. Um, so keeping the team lean is what we like um, mm-hmm. so that everything is easier. Um, but like we will probably add 50 people by the end of this year. Um, and it will be enough, I think, for the year. Um, and for documentation, I am documenting everything. We are using Notion. And I have folders for every mm. single thing that we are doing. For ads, I have a folder and I'm putting in what I tested, what's the result every single, for every single test. That's like part of my process. Um, and I'm sharing that with the team. So for paid, I don't know anyone to share. But for content, I'm sharing it with our head of content now, our full-time designer. So our designer designs something and then she can see the results so that she can change the creative space on that. Um, mm-hmm. So let's say mission critical part of our process and for others what we are doing is we are recording internal meetings that might be something unusual we are recording everything um Mm -hmm. and then if something comes up now we are working on a series that's between me and obed we are like working on messaging narrative content strategy and from six months from now if like probably we will launch five series two of them will be really good Three of them will be not really good, um, like compared to other ones. And then those two ones, we will go back and then find the clips and then launch them to like show people this is how we thought of the series and it's how it came out to be. Um, that's something that we work on. And for the other ones, like LinkedIn ads, SEO, stuff like that, we my strategy is like testing stuff, becoming successful with a couple of ones, and then creating creating a like playbook or something like that. So for LinkedIn ads mm-hmm. playbook, we like test it. LinkedIn has for two months. We spend, I think, 10, 20K um, on LinkedIn. And then ROI was like 8, 9X in terms of pipeline value and a close one. So I created everything. I built everything in, in a Notion doc and then mm-hmm. turned it into a playbook and then launched it on LinkedIn. And then even now, people go into the website and check it out and they need to enter the email addresses. When they enter the email addresses, we can identify the previous visits and visits after that. So when that person comes to the website again, checks out pricing, I can see that, and then our team can reach out. So everything connects to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's all so meta that you're documenting what you're yeah. learning on LinkedIn, and then you're getting more audience from LinkedIn. So that's really cool. And we'll share the yeah. link to that playbook because it's really detailed. I think people will really want to check that out. But mm-hmm. and that's one thing that a lot of teams I talk to and myself included, as you get bigger, you get more siloed and you forget oh, this would be useful for design to see this stuff. This would be useful for the content team to see how this ad performed, right? Yeah, I think recording internal meetings is something that I just thought yesterday, by the way. Um, it's going to be huge. Uh, and if we were like, if we decided that earlier, now we would have lots of content um, to work on because we decided mm-hmm. on lots of things. For example, if I would, if I had recordings of the first how like we came up with the first LinkedIn ads strategy, categories of ads that would be massive right now. Um, mm-hmm. And now we are, what we are doing is we are also documenting, like we got into YC um, and we documented before the interview is what we think, and then after the interview, and we create a documentary with people reacting to it, our advisors, our team members, mm-hmm. um, and after so that, cool. like 
yeah, we are talking about what we are going to do now. Um, so yeah, documenting and creating content pieces is going to be a huge part of our strategy. That's very cool. And it's been cool. I mean, I think I've been on LinkedIn maybe a little longer than you, but it used to be such a dry, boring place. <laughs> and it's, it's so cool to see that people are sharing, like like you said, internal recordings that would not have been a thing on LinkedIn five years ago. It was very polished and it was just like PowerPoint presentations that people made for a conference, right? Yeah, exactly. And now as we hire more people, um, what I'm focusing on is like um, getting a vision in place that mm-hmm. everyone is aligned on setting the goals and leaving them alone uh, because it's like if you get the smartest people then you need to leave them alone to work on that vision um that's mm-hmm. my core focus so if they come up with something or question or like something like if can we get this can we get this person can you talk with this person stuff like that i like then um get in and then do that but other than that, i'm just like this is a vision. This is what I want to do. Um, this is why. Do you have any feedback? Sometimes they have feedback, and then we change the strategy, change the vision a bit, and then they're just working. I'm there to support, and I'm doing my own thing mm-hmm. to like support them. And that's that takes a lot of trust. So, do you find are there certain qualities you're looking for when you're hiring, so that you know that you have the right team that you can kind of let go a little bit and let them do their own thing? Yeah. Um, but I think the first, and for all the revenue-facing teams, we have a requirement to be active on LinkedIn, by the way. Um, mm. That's a like requirement yeah. first, probably the first question that we ask in the interviews. That's for only the revenue-facing teams, not like for engineers. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, what I'm looking for is something that shows in their like background or stuff they talk about, something that shows that they started something from scratch. Most people that we work with, for example, Obed has created his own agency, scaled it, and then left it because he got bored, I think. Um, For other people, they were like an advisor at a startup. Um, And just like starting something from scratch or wanting to start something from scratch as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it shows in the process. For example, an example is with D, um, D was at Metadata, um, and then he joined us as head of revenue and first sales hire. In our first call, he said, "Okay, um, let me create a sales plan for you." And we didn't talk about anything. My, I didn't talk about my plans, but he said, "Okay, now I know like who you're looking for. I don't know your goals. Let me create a sales mm-hmm. plan and then meet in three days, and I'm gonna show you a deck of what I can do with you." And then in that meeting most of the things that he talked about were exactly what i'm looking for he said like i'm gonna be a sales rep but i'm also gonna be on podcasts i'm gonna be networking this is what i'm looking for personally and he also created a sales plan with like raising prices going to do this companies figuring out our icp a little bit more um stuff like that that shows in the interviews um yeah I think that part of that is also he's int- he know he knew he's interviewing at a startup. If you he was interviewing at bigger companies too, um, mm. but I don't think he would do that at a bigger company. So that's a I think cost of joining a earlier stage company. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes down to taking initiative and showing like, hey, I can I can do this, and then I'll run it by you. But I don't need yeah. you to tell me go make a sales plan if I'm a sales leader, right? Like that's Ex- part exactly. of the job. Exactly. How does it work at Chile Parker now? That's a good question. Um, we also, we don't necessarily say you have to be active on social, but we, de- we do kind of, that's part of the process. Obviously, we want to grow on LinkedIn mm-hmm. too. So that's part of the criteria-ish kind of vague. Um, but we usually, again, we want initiative, but it's more about, we just want to trust that people can go and do things because we're fully remote. We have no plans to ever be in an office. Mm-hmm. So it does take a little bit more trust than the typical, we're going to see you on Monday and you'll be here at this time. Um, everyone's off doing their own thing, traveling and still getting their work done. So we just have to hire people that are motivated and self-motivated without being kind of chased for things. Awesome. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit, I'd love to hear about, you mentioned that certain channels didn't really work for you and you had to 
pause things, move budget around. Is there anything in the last few months that you've really had to pause and just kind of reevaluate, especially like budget wise? Um, in the last months, no. But a year from now, we were have, f- focusing heavily on SEO. It worked well in terms of traffic and initial mm-hmm. customers. But I think as we focus more on it, we saw that our product is so complex mm-hmm. um, and it's a new category. So SEO might not be the best thing to focus on right now. So we went on with LinkedIn. I mm-hmm. think for simpler products and more like well-known industries and categories, like a pop-up tool, SEO might be the best option because it's cheaper, um, gets you convergence in the long term, and everyone knows what a pop-up does. So with us, attribution is not a like category that everyone knows in and out. And we are also mm-hmm. trying to build something new. So for SEO, and also it's really hard to get people to write about this. That's also another challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's tough too because... I feel like if you ask 10 marketers what attribution is, you'll get 10 different answers. So if doing SEO exactly. for something like that is very hard. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But we, we were successful. Like we reached, I think we focused on it for six, seven months. We were at mm-hmm. 10,000 clicks after that. We still have, I think, six, seven K, even though we have not posted in the last three, four months. Mm. Um, it set the foundation. Now we have a good domain authority. So if you want to focus on it next year, we will still have that domain authority to start. So we're we're not going to start from scratch. That's good. But if you Mm -hmm. were to focus on it another year for another year, then we would not be at this position right now. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to, like you said, you don't want to lose that momentum, but it's not the focus right now and that's okay. So you can move on. Exactly. Cool. Um, looking ahead to the future, what are you looking forward to? It sounds like you guys have some fun announcements coming up pretty regularly, but anything in the next maybe six months or so that you could talk about? Yeah, I'm looking forward to this documentary that we will launch about Y Combinator. It's confidential <laughs> right now, so we cannot do that. We are, and we are still working on a video. I'm looking forward to building out the media company. And we have some creative stuff like songs, videos, skits, etc. I'm looking forward to those, how, how they're going to turn out. And last thing is I'm looking forward to partnerships. So we have not focused on partnerships yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and the funny thing, Obed, I think, talked with your CEO yesterday. And she yeah. wanted to be a partner to you. <laughs> the mm-hmm. companies like Chili Piper, Lavender, um, Nevada, we're like, talking with a couple companies to partner on content um, and other things we can do in terms of product marketing too. So I'm looking forward to those as well, how they will turn out. Very cool. Yeah, especially for a tool like yours, you just need to have a certain level of sophistication in their tech stack already as a marketer bringing on attribution. So it makes total sense to partner with other MarTech tools that are already embedded in those customers. Yeah, and an advantage that we have is um, if you like partner with a product, get the usage data, and then like development development is on our end. We will just build an integration. And for mm-hmm. that point on, the other companies, customers can see the ROI, the value that investment that goes into that product easily with hockey mm-hmm. sack. So it's like um That's you don't have anything for to build. A partner. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Um so let's move on to our quick fire round. Just a couple more questions for you while I have you. First, is there mm-hmm. another marketer that you follow and really enjoy their content that our audience should go check out? Yeah, um, all that. Just, I think Justin Rowe is doing an awesome job um, of Impactable. Mm. He's really good. John Berg at Cognizum is really doing good. Um, and then not marketing, but probably marketing plus sales. Mark Kosoglo is awesome. And he's joining us as an advisor too. Um mm. Yeah, this four would be awesome. Yeah, those are four. great recs. Yeah. What's an under the radar channel or maybe a tactic, maybe a new LinkedIn ad format um, that you guys are testing out that's really working for you right now? Yeah. Um, before we were like looking at 
specific tactics like would I see a work would this work what we found out is everything works it's just like the combination of different stuff and how we can build that connection now what we're focusing on is four or five core channels that we can focus on and how we can tie them all together to be everywhere that our, our audience hangs out in so this mm. is one thing that we're still working on as a strategy probably cool yeah I'd love to see the playback playbook on that <laughs> once you've put that together I'm sure you're going to work on it yeah, that's going to be awesome. Great. And lastly, where can our audience go to find out more about you and follow you? I'm assuming LinkedIn, but anywhere else you want to plug? Yeah, LinkedIn. And then um, we have a new setter on the flow. You can also subscribe to that. Cool. Great. I'll put those links in the show notes for our audience. Thanks so much, Amir. This was a great chat. Thank you, Tara, for having me. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode. Thanks for listening to Demand Gen Chat. Demand Gen Chat is a Chili Piper podcast, hosted by Tara Robertson and produced by me, Nola McCoy. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It only takes five seconds and helps other marketers like you discover Demand Gen Chat. Also, if you'd like to have a question answered in a future episode, you can connect with Tara Robertson on LinkedIn. Send her a DM with your question and it could be answered on a future episode. Finally, if you've gotten this far and are wondering what Chili Piper even is, Chili Piper helps B2B marketers book more qualified meetings for their sales teams. You can't afford to leave opportunities on the table. So let your lead self-qualify and schedule a time with the right rep instantly. And that's just one of the many revenue impacting things that Chili Piper does. Visit chilipiper.com to learn more. And thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Demand Gen Chat.